Let us now discuss structured steel forms or systems. As we said, steel is a very versatile material that is widely used in construction due to its strength, durability, and flexibility. Various steel structural members are employed in building design and engineering to meet different requirements. These members or components can be uh, can come in form of beams, which can be of the shape I, H, channels, angles, T's, pipes, or tubular sections. Components can be trusses, space frames, and uh, plated girders. All these components can be combined and customized to create a wide range of uh, structural systems or structural forms uh, meeting the specification of a construction project. The choice of the structural form depends on factors such as load-bearing requirements, span lengths, architectural uh, considerations, and cost-effectiveness. So we will discuss these structural systems or forms one by one. The first is braced frame structure. In the braced frames, the lateral resistance of structure is provided by diagonal members shown in this figure. These diagonal members together with girders form the web of a vertical truss with columns acting as cords. Because the horizontal shear on the building is resisted by the horizontal components of the axial tensile or compressive action in the web member, bracing systems are highly efficient in resisting lateral loads. So in this figure, we have a 2D steel frame shown and one of the bay is braced. In this bay, we have got intermediate bracings and at the end we have got two cords so this is like a vertical truss and this vertical truss is stiffer than the other base other words it will attract most of the lateral load now this vertical truss has got internal braces and external cords the internal braces will attract the maximum proportion of the load and a small proportion will go into the cords. Bracing is generally regarded as an exclusively steel system because the diagonals are inevitably subjected to tension for one or the other direction of lateral loading. The efficiency of bracing in being able to produce a laterally very stiff structure for a minimum of additional material make it an economical structural form for any height of the building. An additional advantage of fully triangulated bracing is that the girders usually participate only minimally in the lateral bracing actions. Consequently, the floor framing design is independent of its level in the structure and therefore can be repetitive up the height of the building with obvious economy in design and fabrication. A major disadvantage of diagonal bracing is that it obstructs the internal planning and the location of windows and doors. For this reason, braced bends are usually incorporated internally along the wall and partition lines, and especially around elevator, stair, and service shafts. Another drawback is that diagonal connections are expensive to fabricate and erect. The traditional use of bracing has been in story height, bay width modules that are fully concealed in the finished building. External or larger scale bracing have also become common recently. In this another figure, we can see that there is bracing system extending over many stories and many bays. This is also one of highly efficient structure but aesthetically attractive building. The other form of structures are rigid frame structures. Rigid frame structures consist of columns and girders joined by moment resistant connections. The lateral stiffness of 
rigid frame bent depends on bending stiffness of the columns, girders and connections in the plane of the bent. The rigid frame's principal advantage is its open rectangular arrangement which allows freedom of planning and easy fitting of doors and windows. If used as the only source of lateral resistance in buildings in its typically say 20 feet up to 30 feet base size, rigid framing is economic only for building up to 25 stories. Above 25 stories, the relatively high lateral flexibility of frame calls for uneconomically large members in order to control the drift. Rigid frame construction is ideally suited for RC concrete building because of inherent rigidity of RC joints. In steel frame buildings also rigid frame form is found but the moment resistant connection in steel tend to be costly. The sizes of columns and girders at any level of a rigid frame are directly influenced by the magnitude of external shear at that level and they therefore increase towards the base. Consequently, the design of the floor framing cannot be repetitive as it is in some of the brace frames. A further result is that sometimes it is not possible in the lowest stories to accommodate the required depth of girder within the normal ceiling space. Gravity loading also is resisted by the rigid frame action. Negative moments are induced in girders adjacent to columns, causing the mid-span positive moments to be significantly less than in a simply supported span. In structures in which gravity loads dictate the design, economies in member sizes that arise from this effect tend to be offset by the high cost of rigid joints. While rigid frames of typical scale that serve alone to resist lateral loading have an economic height limit of about 25 stories, smaller scale rigid frames in the form of perimeter tube or typically scaled rigid frames in combination with shear walls or brace bands can be economic up to the greater heights. Infilled frame structures. In many countries, infilled frames are the most usual form of construction for tall buildings up to 30 stories in height. Columns and girders, framing of reinforced concrete or even sometimes steel is infilled by panels of brickwork, blockwork or cast in place concrete. When an infilled frame is subjected to lateral loading, the infill behaves effectively as a strut along its compression diagonal to brace the frame. Because the infills serve also as external walls or internal partitions, the system is an economical way of stiffening and strengthening the structure. The complex interactive behavior of the infill in the frame and the rather random quality of masonry has made it difficult to predict with accuracy the stiffness and strength of an infilled frame. The next type of frame structure is wall frame structure. In the case of wall frame structures, we have got shear walls combined with rigid frames in which the walls tend to deflect in a flexure configuration and the frame tend to deflect in a shear mode. Both the shear mode of deflection and the flexure mode of deflection make a common deflected shape of the wall frame structure. The walls and the frames are constrained to adopt a common deflected shape by the horizontal rigidity of the girders and slabs. Consequently, the wall and frames interact horizontally, especially at the top, to produce a stiffer and a stronger structure. The interacting wall frame combination is appropriate for buildings in the 40 to 60 story range, well beyond that of rigid frame structures. 
An additional less known feature of the wall frame structure is that in a careful tuned structure, the shear in the frame can be made approximately uniform over the height, allowing the floor framing to be repetitive. Although the wall frame structure is usually perceived as a concrete structure form with shear walls and concrete frames, a steel counterpart using brace frame and steel rigid frames offer similar benefits of horizontal interaction. The braced frames behaves with an overall fracture tendency to interact with the shear mode of the rigid frame. Now we move to frame tube structures. The lateral resistance of a frame tube structure is provided by a very stiff moment resistant frame that forms a tube around the perimeter of the building. The frames consist of closely spaced columns, 6 to 12 feet between the centers, joined by deep spandrel girders, as shown in this figure. So we have in this figure a perimeter rigid frame wrapped around the whole building. Although the tube carries all the lateral load, uh, the gravity load is shared between the tube and the interior columns or walls. When lateral loading acts, the perimeter frames align in the direction of loading act as the webs of the massive tube cantilever and those normal to the direction of the loading act, act as a flange. The close spacing of the columns throughout the height of the structure is usually unacceptable at the entrance level. The columns are therefore merged or terminated on a transfer beam a few stories above the base so that only a few larger, more widely spaced columns continue to the base. The tube form was developed originally for buildings of a rectangular plan and probably its most efficient use is in rectangular shape. However, it is appropriate for other plan shapes and has occasionally been used in circular and a triangular configuration. The tube is suitable for both steel and reinforced concrete construction and has been used for buildings ranging from 40 to more than 100 stories. The highly repetitive pattern of the frame lends itself to prefabrication in steel and to the use of rapidly moving gang forms in concrete which make it rapid constructions. The highly repetitive pattern of the frame lends itself to prefabrication in steel. The frame tube has been one of the most significant modern development in the high-rise structural forms. It offers a relatively efficient, easily constructed structure appropriate for use up to greatest of heights. Aesthetically, the, tube, the tube's externally evident form is regarded with mixed enthusiasm. The next structural form is tube-in-tube -tube structures. This variation of frame tube consists of an outer frame tube, which is called the hull, together with an internal elevator and service core. The hull and core act jointly in resisting both gravity and lateral loading. In, this, in a steel structure, the core may consist of braced frames, whereas in a concrete structure, it would consist of an assembly of shear walls. To some extent, the outer frame tube and the inner core interact horizontally as the shear and flexure component of a wall frame structure with the benefit of increased lateral stiffness. However, the structured tube usually adopts a highly dominant role because of its much greater structural depth. The next system is bundle tube structures. Bundle tube structure is a notable form adopted by many tall buildings, such as Sears Tower in Chicago and Burj Al Arab in Dubai. In the case of Willis or Sears Tower shown in this figure, we have four parallel rigid steel frames 
in each orthogonal direction which are interconnected to form nine bundled tubes as shown in this figure similar to single tube structures the frame in the direction of lateral loading serves as webs of vertical cantilevers with normal frames acting as flanges the introduction of internal webs greatly reduce the shear lag in the flanges consequently their columns are more evenly stressed than in a single tube structure and their contribution to lateral stiffness is greater this allows the columns of the frame to be spaced further apart and to be less uh, obtrusive in the cs or willis tower advantage was taken of the bundled form to discontinue some of the tubes and so reduce the plan of the building at stages up the height this same trend is followed in burj al arab another structure form is brace tube structure in the brace tube structures the efficiency of the frame tube is improved by adding diagonal bracing to the faces of the tube this correspondingly increase the efficiency of the brace tube structure by enabling it to go even to further heights this type of arrangement was first used in a steel structure in 1969 in chicago johns hancock building in the steel tube the bracing traverses the faces of the rigid frames where as shown in this figure because the diagonals of the brace tube are connected to the columns at each intersection they virtually eliminate the effect of shear lag in both the flanges and the web frame as a result the structure behaved under lateral loading more like a brace frame with greatly diminished bending in the member of the frame consequently the spacing of the column can be larger and the depth of the spandrels less thereby allowing larger size windows than in the conventional tube structure in the brace tube structure the bracing contributes also to the improved performance of the tube in carrying gravity loading differences between gravity load stresses in the column are evened out by the braces transferring axial loading from the more highly to the less highly stressed columns core structures in these structures a single core serves to carry the entire gravity and horizontal loading in some cases the slabs are supported at each level by cantilevers from the core in others the slabs are supported between the core and perimeter columns which terminates either on major cantilever at interval down the height or on a single massive cant cantilever a few stories above the ground the merits of the system are mainly architectural in providing a column free perimeter at the ground level and at other level just below the cantilever the structural penalties are considerable however in having only the small effective structure depth of the core and therefore being inefficient in resisting lateral loading as well as in supporting the floor load by cantilevers which is a highly inefficient structural component outrigger brace structure this efficient structural form consists of a central core comprising either brace frame or shear walls with horizontal cantilevers outrigger trusses or girders connecting the core to the outer columns when the structure is loaded horizontally vertical plane rotation of the core are restrained by the outriggers through tension in the windward columns and compression in the leeward columns the effective structural depth of the building is greatly increased thus augmenting the lateral stiffness of the building and reducing the lateral deflections and moments in the core in effect the outriggers join the column to 
to the core to make the structure behave as a partly composite cantilever. Perimeter columns other than those connected directly to the end of the outriggers can also be made to participate in the outrigger action by joining all the perimeter columns with a horizontal truss or girder around the face of the building at the outrigger level. The large, often two-story depths of the outrigger and the perimeter trusses make it desirable, desirable to locate them within the plant level in the building. The degree to which the perimeter columns of an outrigger structure behave compositely with the core depends on the number of levels of the outriggers and their stiffnesses. Multi-level outrigger structures show a considerable increase in their effective moment of resisting over single outrigger structures. This increase diminishes, however, with each additional level of outrigger, so that four or five levels appear to be economic limit. Outrigger brace structures have been used for building from 40 to 70 stories high, but the system should be effective and efficient for much greater heights. Suspended structures. The suspended structure consists of a central core or cores with horizontal cantilevers at roof level to which vertical hangers of steel cable, rods or plate are attached. The floor slabs are suspended from hangers. The advantages of this structure form are primarily architectural in that, except for the presence of central core, the ground story can be entirely free of major vertical members, thereby allowing an open concourse. Also, the hangers, because they are in tension and consequently can be of high strength steel, have a minimum size section and are therefore less obtrusive. The potential of this later benefit tends to be offset, however, by the need to proof the hangers against fire and rust, thereby significantly increasing their bulk. The suspended structure has some construction advantages in allowing the core cantilevers and hangers to be constructed while the slabs are being poured on top of each other at ground level. The slabs are then lifted in sets and fixed in position. This is shown in the second figure over here. The structure disadvantage of the suspended structure is that it is inefficient in first transmitting the gravity load upward to the roof level cantilevers before returning them through the core to the ground and that structural width of the building at the base is limited to the relatively narrow depth of the core. This restricts the system to building of lesser height. A further problem is caused by the vertical extension of slender hangers that over the range from zero to full live loading can result in significant changes in the levels of the edges of the slab. This effect increases at each level down the length of the hanger and consequently is worst at the lowest hung floor. The problem can be limited by restricting the maximum number of floors supported by single length of hanger to about 10 and by having multi-level cantilever systems. Similarly to outrigger structures and for the same reason the cantilevers are normally incorporated within the plant level. Variations from the single core hanging structure include two and four core structures in which vertical hangers are suspended from massive girders that span between the cores or in which hangers are draped catenary fashion between the cores. The benefits of such multi-core hanging structure include large open floor spaces at all levels and the possibility of column-free ground story. The final structure form is space structures. The primary Load resisting system of a space structure consists essentially of a three dimensional triangulated frame as distinct from an assembly of a planar bench, whose members serve dually in resisting both gravity and horizontal loading. The result is a highly efficient, relatively lightweight structure with a potential for achieving the greatest heights. The second 
the 76 story HSBC Bank or Hong Kong Bank of China building is a classic example of space structure. Although simple in their overall concept, space structures are usually geometrically complex, which calls for considerable structure ingenuity in transferring both the gravity load and the lateral load from the floors to the main structure. One solution is to have an inner braced core which serves to collect the lateral load and the inner region gravity loading from the slabs or a number of multi-story regions. At the bottom of each region, the lateral and gravity loads are transferred out to the main joints of the space frame. Let us dig a bit deeper into the understanding of Bank of China building. The Bank of China building uses the concept of a braced facade, but with several important innovations. Before explaining the structural action, it is helpful if the external shape of the building is understood. Essentially, it is a cubical building shown in this figure with a pyramid roof, but with each quadrant sliding down by different amount. This sliding means that the floor plan varies with the height. So the floor plan at this level is different from the floor plan at this level and the floor plan at this level is different from the floor plan at this level. These four plans are shown in the next figure. So from level 4 to 18, we have got a square floor plan having four mega columns. From level 19 till 31, we have got a floor plan in a form of polygon having five mega columns. From level 32 till 44, we have got a triangular floor plan having five mega columns. Finally, between levels 45 till 70, we have a triangular floor plan having three mega columns. These mega columns are responsible for transferring the lateral and the vertical loads down to the ground. Thus, we can say that the Bank of China building uses a so-called mega structure as the primary load path for the wind loads and the vertical loads. This mega structure is in the form of huge columns shown over here. The Bank of China building is a stack of five 12-story buildings, each of which is supported by the mega structure. So in this figure, we can see that there is a stack of five 12-story buildings and that is wrapped up by cross bracing, a trust floor and a mega structure. The loads from the cross bracing and the trust floor are transferred to the mega structure. Speaking a bit more specifically, we have actually got four columns which can be called as the mega structure. There is a central column 5 which appears after level 25. The load from this circular column is transferred to the four mega columns below level 25. Thus, we can say that the central mega column below level 25 is transferring the load to the corner columns by a pyramid structure. This pyramid mega structure is shown over here. So the central column 5 has transferred the load to the four corner columns. As we said, that at the bottom of each 12-story building is a story height truss floor. This truss floor acts as the foundation for the 12-story 
building transferring the load to the mega structures or the mega columns. In this figure, the story high truss floor is shown in a 3D setting. We have the loads from the internal columns coming to this story high truss floor and that story high truss floor transferring the vertical loads down to the four mega columns. Similarly, in the case of lateral load, the brace and the column system transfers the load to the story high truss floor and from there the load is transferred to the mega columns. This building is located in Hong Kong which is an area of very high winds and typhoons and these cause wind loads that are approximately double the wind load carried by the skyscrapers in Chicago and New York. All these loads are resisted by the truss action of facade mega structure. These external facades are cross brace trusses along with the facade columns. The facade columns are following the same mechanics as in John Hancock building. As we said that between levels 4 and 18, we have only 4 mega columns. The elevation view at 1 has got a bent consisting of 2 mega columns, the cross bracings and the story height truss floor. This arrangement is constant till level 70. The elevation two, on other hand, has got the same arrangement, but that continues till level 44. The elevation at level three has got the bracing story height truss system shown over here. Similarly, the elevation of the truss system at four is shown in this figure. So at one, we have got a stack of five 12 story buildings. These cross bracing are covering five stories. At elevation two, on the other hand, we have got only three stack of 12 story buildings. At elevation three, we have stack of one 12 story buildings. And at elevation four, we have a stack of two 12 story buildings. The bracing arrangement at the higher levels are shown in this figure. At the higher levels, there are external facades on the pl plan diagonal. These facades have diagonally braced trusses. Thus, between level 44 and 40, we have a diagonal braced truss at location 5 of the plan. At location 6, on other hand, we have a diagonally braced truss system shown in this figure. Similarly, at location 7, we have a diagonal brace system shown over here between level 18 and 31. The vertical loads from the floors are transferred to the four corner mega column. These loads counteract the tension force caused by the wind loads on the facade mega trusses. This maintains upward reaction at the base of the building under wind loading. Thus, as shown in this figure, we have got the lateral load and the gravity loads applied on the facade mega structure. Adding them up, make sure that the there is no uplift generated at any of the mega column. At the bottom of the tower, the horizontal wind load as well as the vertical load has to be transferred to the ground. In the Bank of China building, this is done by providing horizontal and vertical structures to transfer these forces to the concrete walls that are below the ground. These concrete walls are actually perimeter walls of the basement. For the horizontal wind forces, there are five elements. 
in the lower path. The first one is the facade megastructure. The second one, a horizontal steel diaphragm structure at level 4. The third one, a vertical steel concrete core between level 4 and the foundation. The fourth one is the horizontal concrete diaphragm structure at level 0. And the fifth one is the vertical concrete perimeter basement walls. All these five elements in the load path contribute for transferring the horizontal wind forces to the ground. In this figure, we have got a facade megastructure shown over here. At level 4, we have a horizontal steel diaphragm structure, a vertical steel concrete core between level 4 and the foundation, a horizontal concrete diaphragm structure at level 0, and the vertical concrete parameter basement walls. Thus, at level 4, the horizontal wind loads from the facade megastructure are transferred to the vertical steel concrete core by forces in the plane of the steel diaphragm structure shown in this figure. So, in elevation, we have this wind load and that wind load via horizontal steel diaphragm is transferred to the vertical steel concrete core. From this vertical steel concrete core or tube, these horizontal loads are transferred in the form of shear forces to the concrete diaphragm. From the concrete diaphragm, these shear loads are then transferred to the perimeter walls. There are also vertical forces in the core caused by the push-pull forces from the bending moment. These are carried down to separate core foundation. So as we can see over here, the wind load at level 4 will cause some push-pull forces in the steel concrete tube. And these push-pull forces are separately brought to the ground by the structure shown underneath the steel concrete tube. 